Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. All right, Evan. I know I said I'd start this episode, but uh, everyone here knows this is your time to shine, so take it away, pal. Yeah. The amount of emails I had this morning from golf courses, like, even before it was official, were like, our tee sheets are open, blah, 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 get in, get in, get in. I had two tee times booked before 8.15 this morning. I woke up at 8. That was the first thing I did this morning. So I've got one Saturday, I've got one Monday, and I may even squeeze one in on Sunday before the rain starts. This is weekend is going to be the best weekend ever. Oh, and I also have tomorrow off. So I got a four day weekend of just golf. It is quarantine's over for me. I don't care what happens from now on. Detroit could draft 31st. I don't even care anymore. I am on. I'm buzzing today. Uh, he's not kidding, guys. He messaged uh, in our group chat this morning at like 830 with our show notes for the day. Not once in like the 300 episodes we've done has Evan ever put together show notes. I, this I was like a hummingbird this morning. I have so much to do at work right now. I was like, if I had four arms, that's how fast I was moving. I was getting all this work done. It wasn't even nine o'clock. I put the show notes together for today. I was buzzing. You're welcome. Well, at uh, least one of us has had a good day. <laughs> oh, I've had a good day. At Thanks. least two of us have had a good day. <laughs> Brad, have you not had a good day? I have not had a good day. Tell us why. Uh, because I got the date on when I'm going to uh, get my coronavirus. And I got dinged for almost another $1,000 car repair bill. And for those who haven't, keeping tra- haven't been keeping track, I had a $1,500 bill two weeks ago on my other vehicle. So I'm 2500 in the hole in a span of two weeks in the middle of a pandemic. Everything's coming up, Millos. The I don't universe know balances tell you. itself. Stop doing the drive with your eyes closed trick. Honestly, I think if I did that at this point, it couldn't be any worse than it's been. And like, <laughs> there's zero accidents. That's the thing. This is just all wear and tear coming in at the same damn time. Well, um, Brad, I would love to tell you that it's going to get better. Uh, but you're about to go back to work and be exposed to the public. So uh, between you and Evan, I personally will start taking bets from the fans as to which one of you um, is incapacitated, incapacitated by COVID-19 first. Uh, but I will miss you both dearly. I have some stats that uh, concern me deeply already. So um, obviously, we're in Ontario, but uh, the, the company I work for, we're all across Canada and different provinces are opening at different times. So Manitoba has already been open for a week. So we actually have some stats from one of our uh, from our Winnipeg location about how many people are coming through a day cuz we figure when we first open 20 30 people a day maybe. I sell hockey stuff. There are no arenas open. Nothing here is of critical need, right? Like For reference, Manitoba is like the Minnesota of Canada for yeah. American listeners. So uh they have still been getting 100 people a day on reduced hours. Yeah, I was. And I was we're a Mel bigger store, and my location's a bigger store. Yeah, I was telling Mel this the other day. Uh, she was like, I was telling her about how you're probably going to go back soon, and she's like, "Why? Who's going to hockey stores?" I'm like, Mel, who's golfing? Right? We are, we are opening before the arenas. The only me, me and a coworker were sitting there because uh, we've I've been working full time for about a week now, just getting the store ready for whenever it is we end up opening. Um. We were talking like, what are people going to come in for? Because if it's skate sharpenings or anything like that, you don't need that. Nothing. There's no arenas open. You can get them sharpened whenever. We went through every. Po- we're sold out of rollerblades because our online store took all of those during the thing, so nobody's coming in for those. We we thought of two customers that could come into the store that makes sense. You're buying stuff for the house. You're buying tiles. You're buying sheets. You're buying nets. Whatever you can use at the house. Or you broke a stick playing hockey in your driveway. Everybody else, there's no need to come in right now. But according to Winnipeg, a hundred people a day disagree. Well, best of luck 
Um, like I mentioned, you'll be sorely missed. In the meantime, this is why do... I changed my name on uh, the stream here. <laughs> oh yeah, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. I'm usually Ryan Hanna, but today I am Evans Caddy. Uh, uh, I'm Brad, otherwise known as Wave Two Electric Boogaloo. And it's golf season, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, episode title right there. <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, we do have hockey stuff to talk about today. Um, the Eternal Torment, which is the uh, give-take, give-take of the possibility of a June draft. Um, I have some hypothetical Red Wings historical questions to ask you guys. Um, maybe to echo chamber, but maybe to start an argument. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what return to play might look like. And then, of course, our draft uh, prospect profile before heading into um, overtime. Although, Evan, you did have some quick hits on Sven Barshi and P.K. Subban. I honestly didn't even look into those. So nope, was... neither did I. We're winging it. Yep. So did we want to start that now? No. Yeah, hell yeah. I've been taking no. it. No, no, no. Okay. Um, so... The I guess the super quick one. Uh, let me just find it. Don't have my no. note open. Uh, PK Subban was quoted as saying, "I'm still one of the top defensemen in the league." I pressed X to doubt. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, uh, you know what? I'm not. I'm a PK truther. I think that with a good season and some good rehab, I know he has some injury troubles. He can actually return to form. Uh, but he needs to do those things first, and he's not demonstrated a, an elite ability to defend in a long, long time. Let's not forget, he's one season removed from being a legitimate Norris candidate. That's going to be my pro P.K. Subban argument here. He is not that far removed from literally being one of the top defensemen in the league. Um, This last season, new team. Uh, it wasn't good for him, but a eh, new team, new system, new teammates. Sure. I, I could see there being an adjustment period and okay. You're allowed to have a down year under those circumstances. Uh, he can't be younger than 30 at this point. He's 31. Though. He's 31. Yeah. You're not at the point of your career where that arrow is pointing upwards. So, uh, I will bet he won't be as bad next year as he was this past year. But I bet he won't be anywhere near as good as this season before that. Yeah, I think his best years are behind him at this point, especially the way he plays defense. If he had that stoic Nick Lidstrom style defense or play style, I would maybe disagree with myself. But he's no longer the decor driver anymore. I think he's a, a complimentary piece. And he had 18 points this year. That is a massive drop off. So don't think he's one of the top defensemen anymore. I think I would there's a lot of guys I would take over him. Have you seen New Jersey's blue line? He's the top defenseman until otherwise stated. <laughs> yeah, he is he's the top defenseman on beer on beer league teams. I want to see he's a top around. defenseman on the Red Wings. Oh. Uh, oh my god, I was going to say yes, now? obviously, but uh, I don't know. Even Heronic was on a 40 point pace this past season that's so. double in a bit of of suban's production do you i want pk suban to stick around just to see him and tyler bertuzzi keep throwing their gloves at each other well, they can't be teammates now because of that no. or they could and we need a last dance style documentary of that season yes so, i don't know i saw that headline today though. and had a, a good chuckle yeah Hey, you know, it's half of it's confidence sometimes, and he's got lots of that. You know what? If I'm making nine mil a year to to put up eighteen points, I'm telling everyone I'm the best in the league yeah. too. I don't yeah. care. Uh, the other thing I was looking at is Sven Barchi. I guess he's requested a trade from Vancouver, um, and he said he won't go to the minors, but he doesn't want to go overseas. So that indicates trade, and he thinks he can play on any team in the NHL. He's a little bit old, but is he a quote unquote guy that the Red Wings would want? I, I actually know not a lot about Sven, Sven Barkley's I, last year. His name's been around forever, but I don't really know anything about him. Uh, 20, so, 27 years old. 27. So at 27, I don't think you can call Sven Barkley a reclamation project because even if you revive his career to the point when he was like a 40 point scorer, that's not going to last that long. So for a team like Detroit, that's probably too old to be worth it because you're not going to get any of his 
uh, air quotation prime um, by the time they're good. So could I see him fitting in on a team and playing? Well, yeah, he's done it before. He was a top 15 pick in the draft. The skills there. He's, he's your prototypical Robbie Fabry. If everything goes according to plan, I don't see his ceiling as high as Robbie Fabry's. I don't think it ever was, but yeah, sure. So if you're a team that's like middling, like you're on the fringe of the playoffs or you're, you just want to jump up a little bit, improve your third line. I don't know, a team like Vancouver. Yeah, you could use a guy like that, especially if you have a lack of forward depth. Again, just to spit out a team like Vancouver, uh, they could definitely use a guy like that. Three and a third million dollars a year, though, is is quite a big it's a little high. For so uh, a team would be doing Calgary. Um, I don't know Vancouver. where their cap situation is, but I'm assuming they'd be doing them a favor by taking him. Vancouver. 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 Yeah, he's got 66 goals in 291 games. Who did I say? Did I say Calgary? Yeah, yeah, that's where oh, he, he was drafted. He drafted by yeah. Calgary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, though, he's if everything goes right for Berchi, he's a 40 point player, which isn't bad. I mean, that's what we've been trumpeting Robbie Fabry to be as a 40 to 50 point player. Although I think Fabry is a safer bet, and he's a lot younger. Um. So there's value to him. I mean, if you put him on your third line and you get 30 points out of him, that's not bad. I mean, for $3 million, I don't love it. Like, cause that's Darren Helm, a little less than Darren Helm money for a little more than Darren Helm's giving you offensively. So whatever. I mean, I could see it making sense for some teams. I don't see it making sense for the Red Wings and I don't see it making sense for a contender and I don't see it making sense for a cap strapped team. So that really narrows the market down to five, maybe 10 teams at most. This uh, further leads into Detroit. Like I, We've talked about Detroit and Vancouver being linked into uh, giving them cap relief in the past. Um, a lot of that has surrounded uh, Thatcher Demko. Um, it's a target. It's there for Detroit. Although with all these like rumored European signings and the ones that have actually happened and the all the RFAs that are coming up, I'm not really sure there how many more warm bodies Eisman can choose to bring in. Although he has expressed, uh, of obviously, a large interest in leveraging Detroit's cap space um, as an asset, which is why he was pretty vocal about not liking the proposed draft lottery rules or not liking. Well, unquote. Detroit could come in and be Vancouver's absolute saviors here. But Vancouver's got one big crux, though. A lot of teams coming in to alleviate their cap space are going to look at Thatcher Demko, but the asterisk here is uh, Jakob Markstrom is an unrestricted free agent soon, like in a couple months, whenever the season ends. So they don't know if Demko's their starting goalie next year or not. If Markstrom uh, is re-signed, I mean, Detroit could come in and take Berchi and Louis Erickson's contract, uh, like free up $9 million for the Canucks, just like that. And if you're freeing $9 million up for a team that's desperately trying to get into the playoffs and in desperate need of cap space, yeah, you, I would expect a Thatcher Demko in return for that type of relief. Well, it's an option and almost undoubtedly nothing will come of it, but here's quarantine content for you folks. And frankly, it just because we jinxed it like that, it might actually happen. Um, in all seriousness, though, like, this is the kind of thing that Eisman wants to preserve with these uh, adjusted draft rules. So that's why you'll you'll find teams like Detroit fighting tooth and nail. Teams at the bottom in terms of cap space and teams at the top in terms of cap space will both want the ability to be able to trade no matter when the draft happens. So, um, you know, most hard-pressed teams like Dallas and, and Toronto and Vancouver and St. Louis um, are going to want the option to trade teams like Detroit and, and New Jersey and L.A. and what have you. So a lot coming up here. All right, Evan, that's that's, all uh, that's the later. Evan hour. We'll uh, we'll see you guys in five years. Um, all right, the June draft. I'm uh, I I honestly had my entire talking points for this episode decided up until this morning, which was that I was positive it wasn't going to happen anymore. I was like, there's I, no way. <laughs> let's let's be honest here. Um. The June draft, based on everything I've read, has never come off the table. From what I've seen, um, this has always been a thing that was going to happen. Uh, just to what end? Um, I, I was I heard a really good point today too, because assuming 
uh, everything is delayed as we think it is, but is ultimately resumed as we think it is. And I'm talking NHL, MLB, NBA, NFL, soccer, yada, yada, yada. If the NHL is that concerned about marketing dollars, man, could you imagine having an October draft when potentially the NHL is in the playoffs, the MLB is in the playoffs, the NBA is in the playoffs, the NFL season's in full swing. You want to get your draft completely ignored. That's how you get it ignored. Um, So I don't think that June drafts ever come off. What we don't know is exactly what day and more relevant for us. How does the draft lottery work now? Because I really don't care when the draft happens. I get why the NHL wants to do it in June, and I think I agree with it. I don't care. I want to know how the draft lottery is going to work. That's all I care about at this point. Yeah, I was talking to, I was more like shout talking at Mel about this, um, but I was also talking to um, Eiserman Season on Twitter, and he said something that I've also parroted before, which is that this is the NHL is going to handle this the most NHL of ways, which is that they're still going to end up having the June draft, but they're going to take so long to do it that it doesn't have that like surprise or appeal of the NFL draft. And they're just going to do something to bungle up the rules and it's just going to be boring and not executed properly. So they're going to have it and they're just going to waste the opportunity and it's just going to end up pissing everyone off. And I was like, well, that is the most accurate thing that the NHL could possibly do. Well, right now, the thing the NHL has to worry about is the MLB, because that's likely going to be the first North American sport to resume. It's probably logistically the easiest of the big sports in North America to resume. If that league starts up before you do your draft, you're screwed. You're- you're toast. You better. You might as well do it in November because it's getting ignored either way. Uh, and when we say ignored, we know all us hockey fans and everyone listening to this will watch the NHL draft. But that's not what the NHL cares about. They care about the new viewership, the extra viewership that they would otherwise get. So they're on a clock right now. So uh, if if the NHL is firm in doing this they're shooting themselves in the foot because they should have told everybody last week to shove it. We're doing it. Here's the date. Make your peace with it because now they're just delaying it and delaying it and delaying it and running the risk. One of the other sports is going to overlap it Um, because everybody was in agreement. I think the NHL and the teams alike, if you are doing this, we need at least 30 days to prepare. Well, that puts us in the middle of June now, which if the rumors about when baseball is coming back are true, the League only has a two-week buffer right now, which isn't a lot. That probably means spring, well, whatever you want to call it, spring training, training camp for baseball is starting at that point. They probably need two weeks. So that will be news, not as big of news as when games start, but something. It's something else to take away your spotlight. So um, to to quote one of my favorite comedies of all time, uh, Zombieland, it's time to nut up or shut up. It really is. And and you hit the nail on the head when you said the NHL should have put their foot down one way or the other in the beginning. It should have been an either unequivocal, no, we're not changing the rules last minute. That's unfair to the teams who have, like, it doesn't matter if you have a 0.5% chance or a 7.5% chance or an 18.5% chance. We are not changing the rules of the draft lottery now. Or you say... We're in an unprecedented situation. This is one way we can salvage some revenue. Yes, it sucks, but the draft lottery is arbitrary as is, and this is the least of all evils. You you pick one, you go with it, and you tell teams, if you don't like it, too bad, find a cure for coronavirus in that case. Otherwise, shut the hell up. This is what we're doing. They didn't. Now it's dragging on, and no matter what decision they make, they've given teams the ground to stand on to to you know piss their pants about it one way or the other. Whether you're a, a host of a Red Wings podcast – and you're angry that you had a 57% chance of Alexi Lafreniere taken away from you, and now you're looking at Marco Rossi or possibly Lucas Raymond at number four, and that's you know annoying. Or you're a, uh, I don't know, pick any bottom tier, like a Chicago fan. I don't know where Chicago is in the, the draft lottery standings off the top of my head, but like you're one of those teams where you're like, well, why would I have chosen to trade those players and miss the playoffs just barely if I had no chance at Alexi Lafreniere? I would have rather have gone for it. So... They've already kind of bungled this, but it's not like the best time to have made a decision about this was yesterday. The second best time is now. You have to do it now. And they might as we're or right when we finish recording, because, of course, they're going to do that. Uh, We might have an emergency episode tomorrow. We might Saturday. Who knows? It's all up in the air. Um, But and the thing is, too, we've only been talking about this in a in a sporting context. 
Uh, the NHL is screwing themselves by delaying this in another way. Life is starting to get back to normal in a lot of places in North America. As much as it shouldn't, <laughs> it is. Um, which means now, you know, idiots like me are are back to work full time, 40 to 50 hours a week. I mean, not everybody works at a workplace where you have to work into the evening like I do, but a lot do. And guess what? If obviously with what we do here, I book the draft off, so I'm not at risk, but people will be working through the draft. Now they might go out with their family, their friends, like the whole benefit the NFL had when they did it was every human being except for like 10% of the population was bored in their living room, willing to watch anything that will not be the case for the NHL now. And the longer they go, that will be even less the case unless they drag their heels so damn long that they get it in wave two when everything's (laughs) shut down again. (laughs) All right. So for some context, um, 31 thoughts, uh, that'd be Elliot Friedman and Jeff Merrick from Sportsnet. Um, their most recent episode mentioned some updates about the draft, and Elliot said that uh, when he's spoken to teams, anybody who's willing to talk, that they believe the June draft will still happen. Um, and the general notion is that the long pause from you know whenever we started shouting about this at you on the podcast to now is uh, essentially Gary Bettman and Bill Daly getting their ducks in the row because it's going to be a big decision. Um, you know, nut up or shut up is an easy thing to say from the, the comfort of your own homes with your third beer of the evening in front of you. But the reality is, like we mentioned, you're going to piss off a lot of teams and this is a big logistical hurdle. So that's probably them just getting all of that in order. Um, He feels like it's a 50-50 thing at this point, but we're almost certainly going to find out one way or another this week. And just to give you some context about what this week is, it is currently Thursday evening at 5 p.m. Eastern, which means that if this is going to come out, it's going to come out on Friday, and this episode is not going to be evergreen, and we're going to have to record another episode and butt into Evan's tea times or asleep before his tea times, and we're going to have to put up with cranky Evan trying to end the episode. Yeah. Uh, We actually, we've, for the past couple of weeks, we've been pushing our Wednesday episodes until Thursday, just in case news dropped. Uh, And this is our penance for that. So the dream's not dead. I have no energy left in me to hope. It's not that I have no hope. I have no ability to hope anymore. Is that crazy? Optimism has been dead for me for a while. Oh, that's, that's your second kid. That's, uh, (laughs) The the lively bouncing off the walls, Brad w- died when he had a second child, and he realized that it's not the same as having one child. It's like having two child, but maybe even more. It's exponential increase. It's not like the workload doubled. Somehow the no. workload tripled. Um, it didn't double. It increased by an order of magnitude. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, Hank slept in this morning, though. It was nice. I got up at 7.15. Um, yeah, I I don't know. I'm just... Whatever, I, whatever the worst case scenario is for the Red Wings, I've just accepted that's going to happen at this point. So I don't know how we're going to pick sixth, but we're going to pick sixth. Um, and anything above that, I'll take as a win. Honestly, the the solace for me is I get kind of upset about it, knowing that the Red Wings are going to be back to having an over fifty percent chance at fourth overall. And then two things come into play for me. One. Yeah, we had the hope of that fifty seven percent chance, but it was never a real thing. So are you going to be upset about? that no it sucked that you had the hope but that's whatever two at this point one of lucas raymond or tim stutzel i'm convinced will be available at pick four i I mean obviously yeah they're absolutely going to be my concern to be detroit not picking one of them (laughs) because uh who was it helene st james had the red wings in her mock draft at four taking jamie drysdale no 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 no. listen i'm not wrong that that's possible I just can't. I can't go and do another side of reaction. I just can't. No, I, it's it, okay. A, I don't think Drysdale's good enough to pick fourth overall. I, I mean, we've all said on here. I wouldn't be surprised if he goes third or fourth overall because there's a team there that is just desperate for defensemen. Uh, that is not Detroit's case. They have a very strong pipeline at defense, which we can't reiterate enough. I know the team. The NHL Red Wings defense is a travesty, but if you look through their pipeline, it is not. There's a lot of hope. Um, their offensive prospect pipeline uh, could be considered a travesty given how bad this team is. So 
I don't think there's a, a, a logical reality where the Red Wings don't pick a, a forward at four. Um, obviously, if it's me, I would hope it's Stutzler or Raymond. Um, We're drafting would... you fourth? Yes. Hey, I'm a forward. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. Um, I wouldn't be devastated if it's Rossi. But yeah, I mean, well, I'm not getting into this whole conversation again. We've went over this a million times. But uh, God, we expect anything at this point. Yeah, there's... It's it's important to get back in the mindset of anything better than fourth overall is a net positive compared to where we were when the season ended um, for the Red Wings. Like it's you can't expect anything better than eighteen and a half percent chance at first overall with Ottawa having a twenty five percent chance. You can't really be mad at Ottawa because they made a great trade to get that first pick that San Jose was stupid enough to not protect. Um, it is what it is, and, and that's the current draft lottery, and it's stupid. And I hope that no matter what happens, this is the last year of the league pretending that this version of the draft lottery is the best version to, to deploy, and I hope it changes. That's that's where I've landed with it. Yes. Oh, man. I mean, I, I, I the last two episodes, I've probably spent 20 minutes ranting about how much I hate the current iteration of the draft lottery. So I won't. I won't make the listeners suffer through that again. Um, making the listeners suffer through something, uh, some other stuff that I'm sure we've hashed out before on this podcast. Um, things have been, or uh, part of having no content is um, people have been just like looking back historically at different sports moments. And a very popular thing to look back at is the Pavel Datsuk highlight reel for obvious reasons, uh, which I love. And I, th- I believe it was Dom Lutician that put it out this time. Um, he was just, you know, like recognizing the greatness that was Pavel Datsuk. It was Dimitri. Um, was it Dimitri? It was Dimitri. Oh. Uh, Are you sure? I thought I, I thought if I it's the one Dom. I, if it's the one I quote tweeted that you're talking about. Yeah, it's that one. It was Look, Dimitri. Dimitri and Dom can't both put out. Oh, it was Dimitri. Yeah, yeah, you're right. My bad. I'm sorry, Dimitri. Um, the, they put that out, and then I believe it was Prashanth first who tweeted something about uh, Pavel Datsuk's dominance and how he was one of the best on the planet. Um, I said something similar the next day about how Datsuk at his peak was, I believe, the best player on the planet, and that wasn't uh, a knock on Sidney Crosby. It's just how good Datsuk was. And um, obviously, it's an echo chamber, mostly Red Wings followers. A lot of people agreed, but I saw some disagreement. You know, stupid people showed their ass by saying he wasn't even close, which just was a great litmus test to tell me that you never watch hockey. Um, just putting it out here. And if this is an easy yes, and I won't dwell on it just so it's not just a, like a circle jerk here, but Pavel Datsuk, best player on the planet at his peak in, from like 06 to 2010. Yes or no? Or any time within that range? Uh, at points within that range, yes. Um, I can't say for sure the whole range because man, that is right when Crosby and Mal- uh, Malkin and Ovechkin were getting into their peak. Uh, oh seven oh eight Ovechkin was on a another level. Like he scored sixty five goals that year, and um, by the uh, era adjusted goal total, that was the second greatest goal scoring season in NHL history. So. Man, I love Pav, and there was there was definitely points where he was the best player on the planet, but I don't think any of those points were uh, super long, and I don't think it was super consistent because of just how good the talent was in the league in the in that window. I think if you value the all around game, and I know the empirical evidence suggests that there's probably an overvaluation of defense when you know doing the eye test or. Uh, you know, non-analytical uh, perspective of hockey. Um, I played defense, so I'm always going to be biased in that direction. But watching what Pavel Datsuk did at both ends of the ice and just what he did with the puck, I, I maintain that he was the single most skilled player in the history of hockey in terms of like skill with the puck and his stick. Like I, I don't think anyone else beats him. I think the only players who come close are like Alexei Kovalev at his peak, um, maybe one or two others. But I think Pavel Datsuk was legitimately the most skilled player of all time. Um, I think you consider his two way game like he put up what not, was it ninety six points three years in a row or two years in a row, um, and was still a Selkie winner or Selkie candidate. Like the guy was absolutely world class at both ends of the ice, and people just forget what that meant to the Red Wings. Like 
when we talk about the Red Wings being propped up as like a weekend at Bernie's kind of thing from 2013 to 2015 or 16 or 2011 to then, um, that was because of players like Datsuk being on the team. You have uh, like below replacement level players like Justin Abdelkader on your line, but then you have a world class talent like Pavel Datsuk, and it's going to come out to be a net positive. You you want to hear the the most pessimistic, happy view about that era for the Red Wings, and and why it's hard to ever know for sure if you can consider Pavel Datsuk uh, the best player in those times, because there were a lot of points in that window where you're arguing for Datsuk being the best player on the planet, where I could argue he wasn't even a top two player on his own team, because you're talking about Zetterberg and Lettstrom. Yes. Yeah. Now, obviously, hot streaks, cold streaks, good months, bad months. There's no way to know. But, I mean, Zetterberg was was the best player on the face of the earth in the 08 playoffs. Lidstrom was still winning Norris's at that point. It's, man, no one. How did we only win one cup in that window? Honestly? Don't, don't, Brad, come on. <laughs> we should have had five in that four-year span. Look, uh, I agree. Henrik Zetterberg turned up in a way where I believe that playoff Zetterberg for like a three-year span was the best player on the planet, like bar none. Um, I think the only person who had a dominant enough playoff performance to rival that was the year of getting Malkin won the Conn Smythe. Um, and of course, Nick Lidstrom is Nick Lidstrom. You're right. Um, let's ignore the fact that Pavel Datsuk had either like a terrible knee injury or a hairline fracture in his foot for a couple of playoffs. That, that's neither here nor there. Um, Brad, you mentioned something last episode that got a little bit of opposition um, from some comments, which you, you said Steve Eisman's easily t- top 10 player of all time. Uh, and some people push back on that. Why? I, I just, my thoughts are like you boil it down to look at anyone who's not Wayne Gretzky or Mario Lemieux who put up a like 150 plus point season. Steve Eisenman, correct me if I'm wrong, but he's top 10 in just about every offensive category, correct? I, uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. For the second half of his career, his defense was his strong suit, and he was lauded for um, accepting a more well-rounded game to win championships. And then he went on to lead his team to three Stanley Cups, one of those Cups with one leg. <clears throat> I guess that's more legs than the people who think Steve Eisenman isn't a top 10 player have to stand on in this argument because it's ridiculous. And I know how strong the history of hockey is. I know there's 30 players that you could argue is a top 10 player in NHL history. But to say Eisenman isn't one of them, who, who are the players that you can definitively say are ahead of Eisenman on this? Gretzky, Lemieux, or how? You can make. A I mean, case there's for like Marcel Dion. There's a lot of players you can make a case for at this point, but none that you can definitively say. I would make a case for a ha- a few of them, because uh, obviously I wouldn't put Eisenman as the fifth best player in the history of hockey. But man, there's not enough guys here to knock him out of my top ten. No, he's seven them points, right? Yeah, and he's was just a hair short of seven hundred goals and. I mean, yeah, you 692 want... goals. He was 10th all time on that. Yeah, you're, you're hard pressed to convince me that, that Eisenman, considering his all around games, his history of achievements, um, the way his game evolved over time, what his peaks were, but his sustained output. And, and, you know, if you care about analytics, he put out on that, he put out on that mode alone. But then if you care about intangibles, he's considered the captain. He's considered one of the greatest captains in the history of sports. The Red Wings have had the privilege of having, you know, Gordy Howe, Steve Eisenman, uh, Nick Lidstrom, and, uh, you know, everyone else in their organization. But when people think of the captain, they think of Steve Eisenman and it's him alone. Like it. He, he checks every box you would want. Elite offensive production. Yup, he's among the greatest of all time. Uh, okay, does he play in his own zone? Yup, Mount's the greatest of all time. Intangibles, character. Yup, leader. Yup, longevity. Yup, like what box is he missing? Like the only reason, the only reason he isn't like top five on everybody's list is because he'll always be compared to Gretzky and Lemieux because he 
came up at the same time they did. He had to go head to head every season against two of the three greatest players of all time. Like the late eighties, early nineties was stupid for the talent in the NHL. Cause this was when Yager was coming in. Fedorov was just starting and a million other players. He was the guy behind those two. He took the Lester B. Pearson from them one year. If it wasn't for those, Eisenman's probably got five hearts to his name, a handful of Art Rosses. Like, it's it's insane. It's just because he had to go up against Gretzky and Lemieux, and he should not be punished for that. Seventh in points, tenth in goals, ninth in assists, I believe it is. Sounds about right. Quick research turns out. Pretty concretely top 10 to me. Um, okay. Return to play. Different places around the world are talking about being hubs for this. Um, you see rumors that are unsubstantiated left, right, and center. But the general notion is that if the league does return, it will be under the model of, um, oh, man. Is that a hawk that just landed outside my window? That's sweet. Which one? Kane, Tays, Keith? Uh, Duncan Keith, yeah. Oh, you better run then. Yeah, he's swinging, in the his, face. he's swinging a stick at me. Um, there it is going to be under the model of uh, most games being played in some cities as a hub. Um, that's just what they're working with now. No information is good for more than an hour. So if this isn't an, an evergreen comment, you can't come at me. Uh, places that I've seen volunteer, uh, BC, uh, Edmonton, Arizona have volunteered themselves, Florida, uh, which is a funny one considering. Yeah, the they shouldn't go to Florida. There. No, it's... they should not go to Florida. <laughs> they shouldn't just because Florida man lives there. But anyways, Brady. Um, for... Hey, hey, he yes. is Florida man now. <laughs> uh, for any Florida listeners, I'm sorry. And also, you're just hot Ohio, and I won't come off that point. Um, it it seems like that's what's going to be put forward. I think today we saw some relaxation of the rules in Ontario, as Evan gushed to you about before, which means we're not far away from these um, dreams being put into concrete plans. Execution is a different story. Whether you think they should actually happen is a different story. Um, but I, I think it's something that's it's becoming more and more real by the day. So I don't know. What do you guys think about this whole like decentralized or centralized like play in two to four different places to to finish out 12 games and then a 2014 playoffs. I don't see how the players are going to agree to it. You're going to, if they play, let's not forget if they play any of the games in Canada, anybody entering Canada has to go into a 14 day quarantine. So if you're playing this in Edmonton, say uh, a Tampa Bay lightning fly into Edmonton, they got to sit in their hotel for 14 days. Can't go anywhere. So that's delaying things even further. So this might have to be a U.S. exclusive thing because uh, they have looser restrictions. But because they have looser restrictions, probably means they have more COVID cases. So those are going to be harder hit areas, which means that's not ideal. So you're left with a very limited number of options. You're going to take these players away from their families for three to four months, which isn't ideal and a lot of players won't uh, be in love with. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I get the premise behind it. I still don't like it. I still think it's risky. You get that many bodies in one place, you're risking exposure. I mean, most teams have a private charter, so I'm still a little miffed as to how they couldn't just make this work with everybody at their own team. I get you got to go through airport securities, yada, yada, yada. But I mean... We're asking, do you like this idea? Well, no, I don't. But I don't like any of these ideas. So, I mean, I, I wish I could say I, I sit had a better idea. I don't, unless they come up with a hockey island and like team up with Dana White. But we've already used hockey island as an episode title, right? I don't know. <laughs> Seems like it, I'm <laughs> probably <would> know? <laughs> probably, but yeah, I don't. It doesn't matter. I, I hate all the ideas, but they're going to have to pick one. Uh, unless they don't, but that's not a story we'll get into right now. There's only so much pessimism we can have in one day. We already talked about how we think the Red Wings are drafting six. So. My my pessimistic view right now is we as a society have got so bored from staying at home that we're forcing everything back open. And by the time this all comes to fruition, we'll probably be in the middle of wave two. So it's going to be meaningless. 
Yes, but we will be numb to it at that point, so. Yeah, this is true. Make sure you, uh, in the brief window my store's open, come in and buy your Super Deaker and all the crap you need for when you have to stay at home for another four months. Okay, uh, a weekend, is your Super Deaker worth it? What's that? A we- One weekend, is your Super Deaker worth it? Yeah, I'm still using the thing a dozen times a day. <sighs> oh. I need one so badly. You shoot right, right? Yeah. Very quickly, you will find out how weak your left wrist is. I'm a left-handed person, though. So You will find out very quickly how weak your left <laughs> wrist is. <laughs> oh, Brad, I don't like harsh realities. You know <laughs> That's why I'm friends with you two. You mostly leave me alone because you don't like me, so you don't talk to me more than you need to. <laughs> uh which you can also tell because I don't think we've heard from Evan in the past 32 minutes. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> He's just been uh, looking at anything golf related he can right now. Oh, Evan, yeah. w- when you mute your mic, do you just turn it off completely? I turn it off on the on off switch. Yeah, I knew it. I, c- I can hear him do it every time. I'm like, why isn't he clicking mute on like our recording software? But no, this, this caveman is turning it physically off on his on his actual yeah. mic. Yeah, I don't know why. It, yeah, it's easier. It's easier because you're af- you're afraid of bringing a, a work Zoom call into the washroom one day. Yeah. Just have you guys a had a old dump? Yeah, I'm not. I, I know you don't do Zoom calls, Brad. But Evan, have you had a uh, work call where you've had a toilet flush yet? Um, no. Definitely a lot of kids and a lot of animals making noises, but yeah, nothing too out- outrageous yet. I've Kids. been on enough conference calls in my life. Adding video to it sounds like the worst thing imaginable. You guys see my hair right now? Like this is not cool anymore. Like not yeah, my hair is out of control. I don't think I could put it like hat. I can't wear hats because like hats generally come in like flex sizes, and it's like large, extra large, and then they're like it'll stretch no matter what. My head still hurts after twenty minutes, and I get those marks on the side, like on my temples. With the biggest like, hats I can find. Like those ones? Yeah, but like much more pronounced. Although we both have big... I think all three of us have big heads. That means something, and I don't want to talk about what. Um, big brain energy. Big brain. Galaxy brains. This is just the Galaxy Brain Podcast. That's our new name. Um, with my hair, I don't think I could wear a hat. I don't think I could actually fit it on my head. Oh. I can't wear flat brims just because I look stupid in them, so that narrows down the... The wall of options for me significantly. Just do what I did. Get get Mel to cut your damn hair. Crystal got sick of looking at my hair one day, and she says, "Can I cut that?" And I just went, "Yeah, sure." She uh, <laughs> she says she's kind of scared to do it, and I say I'm kind of scared to face the reality of where my hairline is actually at right now. <laughs> uh, so I, I didn't win the genetic lottery in many ways, but that's one that I actually did hit. Yeah, you both look like freaking Lego dolls with how your hair like is just perfectly across this, the front of your head. Yeah, well, there very few genetic traits that I'm a fan of, but that's one I got. All right, the NHL draft. This is a prospect which I've actually been pretty excited to talk about because uh, he's my favorite. <laughs> he's my favorite type of player. If you could have me pick one kind of player that I love watching or having on my team the most, aside from which is the most productive on the ice, it is this, um, and it is a two way defenseman. Um, by the way of Ryan O'Rourke, by the name of Ryan O'Rourke in this draft, um, it's someone that we've seen brought up a lot because he's kind of falling into the range of where the Red Wings will be picking with their second round pick. So um, very intriguing player prospect, uh, some differing opinions on him. So uh, Brad, kick us off with what to make of our NHL draft prospect profile of defenseman Ryan O'Rourke. Well, after the way you built him up, I'm a little nervous to start because I, I like the guy, but tread uh, carefully. Yeah, tread carefully. Yeah, I was gonna say, um o- O'Rourke's that that interesting type of defenseman that's always gonna get debates because uh, O'Rourke has the benefit for us of playing in the OHL. So I actually he's one of the few prospects I've got like a healthy amount of viewing on. Um He's he's the guy when I watch him play, none of his skills jump out to me. He's not a, I wouldn't say he's an amazing skater, he's not a bad skater. Uh he doesn't have a great shot, doesn't have a bad shot. Uh puck skills are fine, but not spectacular. Like there's there's nothing about his game that wows me. And his offensive production, mediocre, good, especially for a 17-year-old, not bad. 
uh, but not anything that jumps out at the page for you. Not not second round pick exciting uh, type offensive numbers. But he gets the job done as a 17 year old in the OHL, a predominantly 20, 19 and 20 year old league. He was named captain of the Sioux Greyhounds and they weren't a horrible team. So that's something to really read into in it about his character and his enchantables. But his hockey IQ is off the charts. He, he takes all these uh, slightly above average skills and turns that into a very good player. So again, he, he's the type of prospect that doesn't excite me, but I still want my team to pick him because he just gets the job done. I, I think he's he's the low ceiling, high floor type of pick. I don't think O'Rourke's ever going to play a top two pair in the NHL. But I have a hard time seeing him not eventually making the NHL and being a productive bottom four defenseman. Um, I, I think his worst case scenario is Xavier Ouellette. I think his best case scenario is uh, what Red Wings fans seem to think Gustav Lindstrom is. You know, I mean, it wasn't really necessary to take a shot at Gustav Lindstrom there. But oh, whatever. it's not a shot at him. I, I like him as a player. I, I hate what the fans think he's going to become. Um, Ryan O'Rourke is, and acknowledging what Brad said, I don't think his ceiling is through the roof, but what he is or what he can be to me is um, the kind of defenseman that the Red Wings need, which is someone who can defend very well, uh, separate forwards from the puck, read the play, just make the right simple move, but not be completely, um, you know, decrepit offensively like he, he can read space identify that take the shot make the play in the offensive zone as needed he's by no means an eric carlson in the offensive zone but he's not uh, absolutely useless he, he can make the plays there um without you know making the highlight reel every night and still be pretty effective um i agree i don't think he's a top pair projection i think a good second pairing defenseman would be a pretty optimistic view of him. But if you view him as a um, five to six or a, you know, four to six guy who can fill out the middle of your lineup and not just without being noticed, who can be a, a strong part of an effective team, then yeah, that, that's the kind of pick that you would want Ryan O'Rourke to be. Is that worthy of pick 32? Mm you would want to maybe swing for the fences a little bit more on that. But then if you consider him to be a little bit of a safer pick, then why not? And then just swing for the fences with a later second round pick that like the Red Wings might have um, things that he does defensively that I think might need some improvement. Um, and this is something that he has been working on and he has shown some improvement in as his uh, gap control. So the way he controls the gap between him and then rushing forwards that are moving in uh, against him with a puck, um, it was something that he's kind of been exposed uh, with in international tournaments before, has gotten a little bit better with it, um, and can continue to improve. But a fear of mine is that when players like him take the next step into the NHL or the AHL or whatever it might be, they can almost be re-exposed with that kind of thing. So it really depends on the kind of development he has, the confidence he has to work on those things and whether or not he can continue building on it. But if he continues to get better with his gap control and he can be a stalwart defenseman with, you know, offensive upside, you're looking at, you know, Patrick Nemeth, but who contributes more offensively. And I like Patrick Nemeth for Detroit. I think he's, in a perfect world, he's a third line, uh, third pairing defenseman for Detroit. I mean, right now he's a second pairing defenseman because there's no one really better than him, but, um, for that spot. But still, like, if O'Rourke pans out, I like that pick. If they don't take him at 32, I'm not upset because I think they can swing for the fences and go for someone a little bit more make or break who could be like a, hey, this guy, this guy should have gone top 10, but we got him at 32. If they take him at 32, I'm still happy because it's like, hey, um, you know what? Mo Sider can't be our only competent defenseman. We need someone a little bit more solid. And I'm saying, yeah, sure, why not? I don't think he's a target for Detroit. They took Sider, Tuomisto, Albert Johansson last year within the first few rounds. I I'm not sure that Rourke is a target for uh, C. Weisman's group. I mean, he shoots left and he's six foot two and good defensively. That's that's a lot of check marks as to what the Red Wings are missing right now. <laughs> Legion of Boom, Red Wings edition. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, he I he certainly has NHL certainty. He, there is no doubt in my mind that he will play in the NHL at some point and for a pro prolonged period of time. So if a team's looking for a safe pick, 
get a middle pairing defenseman who basically does everything at a decent level, he's your guy. If you want someone who's got one elite talent, he is not the guy. Um, he's got decent skating. He's got a sneaky good shot, and he plays defense really well. So where he fits in the roster is all going to really depend on his offensive production. And if you think if scouts see the potential of something high, he could be a, a very nice complimentary first pairing defenseman. So if you need a defenseman and you're trying to figure out who to get in the second round and everybody else is gone, the easier guy. Yeah, he's uh, he's going to be a popular pick because I think there's always going to be an obsession with Detroit to replace the Nick Lidstrom era with someone until it comes back. But the reality is that that era is never going to come back. But I think as players like Cider and um, Hronik and maybe McIsaac or even Cholosky progress and fill Detroit's blue line a little bit better, that kind of starvation for the good old days will will subside a little bit. I don't know who it is who's wishing for defense to come back like that. <clears throat> Me. But um, that's kind of the what's going on with the fan base. All right. Um, anything else before we head into overtime? Nope. Go- Bless you guys. All right. Let's go into overtime, which this is a midweek episode. So it's brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Guys, um, these are the people who have allowed the Wayne Wheel podcast to continue going through this quarantine and bring you regular bi-weekly content. Um, so thank you all for supporting us, helping us along to, uh, to becoming, um, the show that we are and, and allowing us to do this. So thank you. And uh, as our way of saying thanks, or one of our many ways of saying thanks, we are going to read out uh, Patreon content or uh, comments exclusively for midweek episodes and uh, stay tuned for the announcement of the winner of the contest sponsored by uh, born to Dan hard in a future episode. Uh, Kiwi, what Kiwi Red Wing says, okay, fellas, uh, I think I have the way we can sort out the draft order for the June lottery. We get the NHL to hold an arm wrestling tournament for the draft order, non-expanded playoff teams only. The arm wrestler has to be a current roster member of the team. Who do the wings get to represent them? And who do you think the other teams would take? I'm thinking we go maybe with Mantha, big lad with some leverage, as long as he doesn't bust a wrist and misses the start of the season. Unless Bernier can low-key bench press a pickup truck, then we should go with him. Is this with like uh, gloves on or? Uh, I mean, strongest player on the Red Wings straight up is probably Mantha. I don't. Yeah, I guess Mantha, right? Like who else is that big where it would be? Nemeth or Erickson would be in consideration, I would hope. Erickson like five years ago, maybe probably. Yeah. I feel like uh, when Max did his article, like uh, pulling the Red Wings as to like, you know, the superlatives or whatever it was, there was someone who was like a gym rat. I think Helm was up there as a gym rat, unless I'm completely misremembering. Um, Alan Snyder says with the signing of Miko Lettinen by Toronto, do you think a late round draft pick would be worth taking a chance on a player like Travis Dermott who may be getting squeezed out or do they still like him enough to try to move someone else? Could we take advantage of taking Cody CC's bad contract off of them? They are not getting rid of Travis Dermott. And if they did, they would be looking for a huge premium on him. That is not a team that, uh, Tr- that is not a player that the Leafs are giving up on. Is Cody Cece's contract not up. Uh, yeah, he's an unrestricted free agent. Uh, Joseph Craig says, when will the pain stop that is this season? Can we just find out how we're picking six this year already and get on with the disappointment? Why did we have the chance thrown in our face, picking no worse than second, just to have it ripped away? I'm just over 2020 so far. Hashtag jaded. Joseph, that's how I feel right now. So fingers crossed for a miracle. Chris Frank says, hey, guys, since Evan is getting back on the course, I am jealous. Our courses are open, but they are book solid all around me. Would you rather play an entire round of golf with your hockey stick or an entire hockey game with your four iron? Thanks for the content, guys, helping me stay sane as I go around selling beers in a pandemic. I would much rather go around a golf with my hockey stick because I'm not a great golfer, so I would notice how bad I am less than vice versa. Evan, which would you prefer? Neither. Actually, anything to get me outdoors right now, so I'll take the hockey stick and golf. I think I take the hockey stick. I think the four iron would just bounce off the ice too much and maybe not get under the puck as much as you need. The Zamboni driver would hate you. Oh, God. It'd be like figure skating out there. 
Um, Joseph D'Elia says, sup, my dudes, in response to calling me and Brad nerds for collecting hockey cards. Uh, Brad plays in a professional hockey league only seven steps below the NHL, and I can almost stop on skates and still learning to skate backwards. So egg on your face now. You're right, Joseph. I'm sorry. <laughs> Brad, I opened up my MVP pack and got six autos, but all were scripted. I bought a Series 2 box, and the best cards I got were a Young Gun, Capo Caco, and a Canvas Canadian Heritage, Nicholas Haig. So back to real hockey talk. Wouldn't uh, wouldn't it make sense to open up trades if they're going to have a draft before the playoffs? Uh, I think it would make the draft more exciting if teams that sold before now buying for the 2014 playoffs. If that's what they're going for, thanks, my dude. Oh man! So you're talking about like trades that a co- could apply for these playoffs? Real oh. new trade deadline. I mean, that would a most of the players that teams wanted to sell have been sold. Um, most of the teams that wanted to acquire have now maxed out their cap. Oh, I I like the chaos behind the idea but logistically i oh that would be hard and i i think a lot of teams would would scream unfair yada 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 uh man i mean i'm here for it but yeah i'm i wouldn't hold my breath on it yeah i think that's the amount of chaos that i would like but if you're we're talking about a pretty well reasoned early June draft lottery, and again biased, yes, uh, that the the league is kicking and screaming and pulling their hair out about, and it's probably not going to happen for that reason. So if you consider what you just proposed, they may as well just they're like, we'll just take the league out back and shoot it. I think it'd be great, but I, I don't think the uh, the old heads in the league would like it. Scooter Max says, "Hey guys, long time listener and new patron. Hey Scooter, appreciate you joining us, and welcome to the Dub Dub family." He says, when it comes to prospect evaluation, how much do you take into account the competition that the prospects put up points against? I've heard that players like Rossi and Byfield generate a lot of their points when playing the weaker teams in their league. How concerning are observations like these to you? So very quickly for me, um, I think that's something that's both undersold and overstated. And that's going to sound like a fence-sitting answer because it is. Um, I think too often people ignore that kind of thing and then become disappointed when their favorite player in the OHL doesn't put up 150 points a year uh, in the NHL at their prime. But I'm also hesitant or I'm also very careful to not hold that against players like Byfield and Rossi. Um, yeah, they might not be playing the best competition, but rather than construing it as a negative against them, I just kind of reduce how much of a positive that is in their favor. If that makes sense, like it's not no longer an earth shattering accomplishment, but it's not exactly a negative either. Like you still have to be good to dominate against these teams is pretty much my line of thinking. Yeah. It's yeah. It's to say everybody factors it in. I don't know if there's anybody who scouts that doesn't factor that in. At all. Thankfully, there's some analytics that as rudimentary as they are in terms of their knowing their effectiveness of translating to better leagues. It helps. Um, again, especially with junior hockey, I think analytics has a long way to go just because it is so new and there are so many variables. But uh, it is another tool in uh, translating. And yeah, the problem with juniors, too, and one of the big things with scouting is not only the de- discrepancy in talent from league to league the discrepancy in size from player to player like it it would be a lot easier for a guy like quentin byfield to translate to the ohl than it would a marco rossi um because byfield's already like physically developed as a full-grown adult um there's so many things you have to take into account so that's that's why scouting is such uh, a crapshoot uh, because you don't know it's it's all guessing it's just bad 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 guesses and good guesses don mitchell says it is thursday my dudes and then does the screaming from the meme <laughs> uh i've officially watched all of a woods videos and all of the nhl weird videos so i'm bored other than ufc fights shout out to anthony smith i'm dying for hockey to return can we just get a single tweet or something about draft nudes please well don Good news for you. The moment that we, we dropped this episode, put a 15-minute timer on for news to come out afterwards. If you three wonderful and beautiful hosts or your amazing listeners are bored and want to follow my Red Wings memorabilia Instagram page, Red Wings Inc., that'd be great. So that's Red Wings, I-N-K, all one word. Um, 
I'm taking this quarantine in stride by sharing my collection, then risking myself by adding at the moment. And I didn't know if anyone would like to see pretty things. So again, that's Red Wings Inc. All one word. Uh, Don made us our uh, handcrafted uh, wooden Gordie Howe signature that you would see in our usual videos when we're in the room together. Um, very much recommend you check out Don's Instagram page if it has anything as amazing as that. Um, if you could bring back any piece of equipment from the 90s, what would it be? Personally, I'd love to see someone rocking a Jofa bucket again. Cheers, boys, and stay safe. Uh, the Nike gloves that Fedorov was wearing in the 97 uh, era. White skates. No. Oh, no. oh Those yeah. Those are awful looks. Oh, yeah. Uh, Dead Panda Society says, how many holes does a straw have? I have 200 hours in Animal Crossing, and I'm not close to stopping. Glad to have some of the cutest villagers out there. Judy and Fauna, who are your favorite villagers you all have? Well, Evan has told me he just got uh, Eric and also Marina and Chevra, but Eric's my boy. I mean, Evan's boy. I mean, it's definitely Evan who plays Animal Crossing. Definitely Eric or Evan. And no. Me. Yeah, it's, I'll never. it's Evan. Eric's, Eric's legit, though. Um, Jake Kiefer says, what are your thoughts on a player threatening to not play for a particular team if drafted? Does the circumstance matter, i.e. family reasons, refusal to move to a different country, or if Edmonton wanted you? Uh, tough, right? Like, we're fans of the Red Wings where that historically might not have happened before, but now it might. I mean... Circumstances matter, but in my mind, there's very few circumstances which wouldn't label the player a problem child in my mind. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Like Lindros's reasons for not going to the Nordiques, not liking the owner. I mean, mm, having to live yeah. in Quebec. <laughs> I mean that that's not a great reason for me. Sure, I can see the logic behind it and you know, I mean, it's your life. You're allowed to do whatever you want with it. Um it's my life. That's all I was saying for the sake of not Yeah. So I I don't know. I don't love it. If if players start doing that, that's just opening up uh Pandora's box of a whole lot of problems we're not going to want to see because then more players do it and then you know how would we feel Alexi Lafreniere first overall yeah I'm only playing for Montreal wow oh, can you imagine the shit storm that would fall after that he would be the least popular player in the NHL outside of the province of Quebec he'll be the most popular player in the KHL <laughs> <laughs> no you know a team would bring him on oh yeah could you guys hear that? No. Well, no, no. I was. I tried playing "It's My Life" by Bon Jovi. Anyways, no, you, uh, you, you failed. Yeah, I did. Matt Whip says, "Hey boys, would you be interested in interested in trading for Matt Murray? If so, who would you guys trade?" Also, can we just acknowledge Goldberg from the Mighty Ducks is absolute dust? After rewatching the Mighty Ducks with my quarantine time, I realized Charlie was also pretty dust. Hot take without Fulton, they wouldn't have won anything. He scored like half their goals, was an enforcer, and he was always super clutch. Thank you for your time. <laughs> I love that. Um, Goldberg, you know, was all Goldberg was like what Carey Price was last season, all reputation but no performance. If that makes sense. <laughs> Sounds right. Uh, he, he was he was the character of the team, so uh, you know he got there on his intangibles, and they had to run with it, and they overvalued them. Uh, Matt Murray. What about Matt Murray again? Do we want to trade for Matt Murray? No, we do not. Listening ears, Brad. Why wouldn't you? Um, because he gets paid a lot of money, has been very inconsistent from a performance and a health standpoint, and. Uh, I mean, what he would like, he's obviously a starting goalie, so Pittsburgh's not giving him away. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd much rather take a flyer on a cheaper, uh, probably cost less to trade for Tristan Jari. Uh, Matt Murray is up as an RFA after this season, whenever this season it does end, at, and his current deal is wrapping up at 3.75 per year. Um, Eric O says any mid first round players in the draft that might start following falling, you'd be itching to pick up the phone and start shopping deals to pick up. For example, a player that might fall to Edmonton's number 20 who weren't expected to be available that our organization and theirs might have a difference of opinion on. 
any player that could be available there that you'd be willing up to give up our 2020 second round picks for that both us and the Oilers would end up seeing as a win-win trade? If so, who specifically keep it tangible? Man, okay, so if we're talking pick 20, that means that's got to be a guy. For me to want to jump up that much, that's got to be a guy from like a borderline top 10 to fall that far. So I don't know. Jarvis? Uh, he'd even be fringe for me trading that far up. I, I'm looking more like Lundell or Quinn. Yeah, you, you're really talking about a guy who could have gone ninth and is all of a sudden at 20th. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Joe Valeno. Right, like you're looking at a Joe Valeno type thing where you can't bank on him being available at 32 for you, so you try to move up and get him. Yeah, it's it would be, it would have to be a hell of a player. And if odds are, if he's fallen that far, we're not the only team picking up the phone. Yeah, uh, Michael Barry says, "Hey boys, the Athletic recently ranked the Red Wings for." The worst Red Wings losses by four or more goals. Oh, what do you think was the worst loss of the season? For reference, number one was Wild seven nothing. Number two was lost to the Leafs six nothing. Uh, Bernie was sick that game, and number three was the Islanders eight two victory. I mean, it, it's got to be Minnesota, right? Because every other game, like the Islanders one was on the road, the Leafs one was with a sent was with a sick goalie. After the other goalie got hurt, like the Minnesota one at home, it's the no excuses game. Like, why? Why was that the game that everything went sideways for them? So to me, yeah, I agree. Minnesota was the worst of them all. I like the other games are very easy to remember. But the fact that we remember a Minnesota wild game, like I remember after that game thinking, yeah, this is the first time where I'm like, I actually don't want to watch this anymore like i can't i got on the podcast the next episode and you guys have been saying like this is painful and i've been trying to remain optimistic and i was like no i can't do it anymore like i actually don't want this and then the monkey paw curled and then COVID 19 happened and blah 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 the, the world and sports are canceled but still that that minnesota game was it's like they weren't playing a hockey team i don't know how else to explain it Alex Ott says, hello, uh, Brad and Ryan. I'm assuming Evan is camped out at the golf course in a tent waiting to be the first one on the course for Saturday. Quick question for you fellows. Any tips or hints for stopping on your outside edges? Can't seem to grasp it for my life. Stay safe and hope, stay safe and hope all as well. Start Ang off with one skate and then transition to two. Angle and pressure. Uh, first mistake people make while trying to stop is keeping their skate parallel to the ice. And that is how you're going to snap an ankle and just fall over. You need to be leaning into that so that your steel is digging in at almost like a 45 degree angle. And, uh, don't just assume it's going to happen. You want to be scraping the ice. Um, so lean into it, like not, don't put your weight the way you're going, lean back, like you're carving on a snowboard, but you want to be scraping some ice when you're stopping, so make sure you're pushing down into that ice with the inside edge of your outside skate, which is the one thing people do. They try to catch all of it with their outside. Well, if you're leaning, you're not getting the outside of that blade in the ice without going ass over tea kettle. So if you're stopping with your left foot out, you should be on the inside of your left foot. Did you say ass over tea kettle? Yeah can't even begin to know uh i'm i married a redneck <laughs> brad you are one i am the furthest thing from a redneck imaginable <laughs> what city were you born in or what town what kitchener were you born in kitchener that's technically born in cambridge but i was there for like a week <laughs> well i mean being in cambridge for your formative years rough I no, I was I grew I I've been in Kitchener since I was a week old. We can tell. <laughs> uh, Cordell Taves says, "Hey guys, been listening since the start of the year and just became a patron a few episodes episodes ago. And yes, I know my support is appreciated." <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to let you guys, mainly Evan, know that my local golf course is opening tomorrow and I'll be able to break the clubs out this weekend. I'll be getting a student discounted membership for 425 Canadian for the summer, Ooh. so suck on that one, Evan. That is just cheap. jokes. Just jokes. All love and love the content you boys continue to pump out. Well, thank you, Cordell. Your content is appreciated and thank you for rubbing anything in Evan's face. Stay inside cheese bags of Fournier Company says, Hey there, fellas. I binged Parks and Rec and Boston Common. What's next? Bojack Horseman, Community, or Ozark? 
or a different show? A Dark Horse candidate? Ooh, I vote 30 Rock because I'm going to start watching 30 Rock soon. I mean, I haven't seen any of the shows that uh, he was talking about there, so I've got no input there. Uh, I've I've talked about Brooklyn Nine Nine on here before. Archer, if that's your type of comedy, we're watching that right now. Yeah, Archer? Yeah, we're, I mean, we'd watch up to like season seven, like independently before, so we're just watching yeah. through it together. Now. Oh, nice. Um, I don't watch that much TV. I'm not a good person to ask this question <laughs> to. <laughs> um, also, when will hockey? Will hockey ever again? That which is of the hockey. Well, I mean, maybe Friday. Oz good for Hall of Fame. Stay sane. Cheese bags. Garrett TV says hockey amigos. We talk a lot about what the league needs to do for this COVID BS and getting the NHL started back up. But what would it take for you guys to be comfortable with hockey again? Like personally, what would it take for you to be comfortable going back one as a hockey player and two as a fan in the stands for what it's worth at this point, I would not even be close to comfortable going back as a fan until there's some level of therapeutic treatment or vaccine or we better understand antibody impacts and disease recurrence. Yelling and screaming in a densely populated arena seems like an absolutely disastrous idea right now. Let's go Red Wings. Oh, I'm I'm not worried. I'm going to have uh, coronavirus within the next month, so I'll have the antibodies and I'll be I'll be immune shortly thereafter. So I I'm good come the fall. No, uh, re- realistically to play, um. It would just have to be entirely dependent on where cases are at in the region because I know we're not getting a vaccine anytime soon. And as much as I'm very on the pro quarantine, take as long as we need, I'm losing my mind without hockey. So I'll probably be one of the first ones back because I'm an idiot. Um, But that's 10 guys. Like there's been arenas that have opened up where you – you're only there's time limits on how long you're allowed to be in the room. Uh, each team gets two rooms so that you can distance. They're encouraging dressing at home, so all that kind of stuff. If it if it's thorough and actually followed, I'll probably uh, be on board. But twenty thousand people in an arena? Yeah, no, not until there's a vaccine. You couldn't pay me to get in that many people. I'll go in a room with twenty people if we're all properly spaced and all that. Not that I have a choice. I'll be doing that in a few days anyway. Um. But yeah, twenty thousand zero chance until until it's gone or there's a vaccine. Yeah, you mentioned therapeutic treatment or vaccine. One of one or both of those would need to exist for me. Um and also some more solid research on um how long immunity is if it exists after initial infection. So I think I've, we've seen some research to suggest that people could be immune for a year and a half to two years after they've had it. Um I don't know doesn't exactly make it promising for me, but it might be a while before we're back in the arena. Eh, it's all complicated. I've learned to stop trying to project things in the future because the world tends to end when I try to do that. I don't know about you, Evan. Oh, yeah. I won't be going to a game for a long time. That is for sure. And in terms of playing, it might be even longer because if someone's dirty-ass body gets anywhere close to me, probably going to get the Rona. Yeah, can't forget the uh, the fun times in the men's shower. <laughs> <laughs> Did you start laughing at your own joke? Before it came out? <laughs> yeah, get this guy at a golf course. He's done. If I can't uh, fully enjoy the aspects of hockey, I don't want to be a part of it. Oh well. Um, for those of you who missed it, uh, I have started picking up some uh, NHL twenty against patrons. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm hoping to do something with Steve Dangle soon. I'm not particularly good, but I did beat up on uh, Sam Slinger, who's one of our patrons. It, it took like eight games for him to beat me. So Sam, sorry, man, but uh, I had to expose you. He ended up beating me in threes with the Wild, which I should be embarrassed about. I was Ottawa. So um, if you guys are interested in that and you have a PS4, I put up a post earlier. Drop your PSN and, and we'll pick up a game. Uh, with that, um, to wrap up this episode, which we will most definitely have to record uh, again right after posting because news will come out. We'd like to thank all of our listeners, our name level sponsors, the septic tank of that bitch, Carol Baskins. Carol Baskins. Jake Kiefer, Bye Felicia, Dead Panda Society, Brad Smith, Andrew Bohan, Scott Martin, Scott Martin, Kayla Thompson, Jacob Turner, Matt McKay, Brandon M, Matthew M Rice, Luke Johnson, Ryan Lewis, Langabeer, Clayton Van Dyken, Kaylin Wood, Hassam Al Qasem, 
Arjun Shanker, Charlie Elkins, Hannah Lee, Josh Rosnowski, Alex Ott, Chris Frank, Connor Leighton, Danny Jr., Matthew Keeler, Craig Kibble, Simon Anderson, Antonio Gracias, John Evans, K. Waz, and Stan Olson. Thank you all so much. We will talk to you, I'm sure, sooner than we think. Evan, good luck on the golf course. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.